Okay, guys, I think we are going to get started here. So I would like to start this. My name is Aaron Ritzig, for starters. I am the newest government contracting specialist here at the Northwest Commission PTAC. And today's webinar is going to be on small disadvantaged business requirements for federal and state contracting. I would like to start by thanking our co-sponsors for this event, uh, Penn West Clarion Small Business Development Center, the North Central PA PTAC, and the Northwest Industrial Resource Center. General housekeeping rules. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Melissa, Robin, and Barb will be there in the chat answering any questions. And if there are any questions they want me to take, we're going to be stopping at certain points throughout the presentation to answer them. If you, if I don't have an answer for you then off the top of my head, then I will be certain to get your contact information and I will find that answer for you. If you would like a copy of the slide deck when you exit the webinar after it's over, there will be a very short survey. Don't worry, it's not one of those like CVS receipt sized ones you get sometimes. Um, if you would answer those questions, one of which is just inputting your contact information, we'll send you out a copy of the slides, and you'll also be helping us to develop better trainings in the future. Okay, with that being said, we are going to start out today with short introductions from Lisa Dash of the Northwest IRC and Corey Riley from the Penn West Clarion SBDC. So Lisa, I believe you are up first. Take it away. Good morning. Thank you for having us, Erin. Um, as you can see, I'm mid-tour at Franklin Industries. We're here with a lean cohort. Um, so we're having a great morning uh, touring Franklin Industries. As Erin introduced me, some of you already know me. I've worked with some of you. My name is Lisa Day, and I'm from the Northwest Industrial Resource Center. Um, just to give you a brief overview for those that are not familiar with what we do, we are a not-for-profit organization that serves mid-sized manufacturers, small and mid-sized manufacturers throughout Northwest and North Central Pennsylvania through a private-public partnership uh, business model. The NWIRC is driven by the impact our consulting and customized training solutions um, that we have our clients' business, the manufacturing is industry as a whole, and our regional uh, economy. We help manufacturers achieve and sustain top and bottom line growth through the implementation of next generation manufacturing strategies, world class improvement methodologies and best practices, advanced manufacturing and customized workforce training and still development programs. The NWIRC was created in 1988 as a part of a statewide initiative and it is one of seven centers that serves uh, manufacturers throughout Pennsylvania. In 2001, just to give you um, sort of our report card that we reported to the state and federal government of how we impacted our clients in our 13 county uh, and those locations, uh, we helped retain 1,249 jobs. Um, we were able to create 129 0.6 million in new and retained sales. In cost savings, our clients recognize $6.3 million. And our clients also recognize $19 million in new investments. Those were all through our help um, and support through the IRC. And we work to address the top challenges we hear from our manufacturers every day, including um, employee recruiting and retention, cost reduction, growth opportunities, product and development. And some of the areas that we focus on are accelerating manufacturing technology adoption, workforce training leadership, development and talent pipeline, ISO quality systems and training implementation and continuous improvement training implementations. Also cybersecurity resources and support and we work along with other strategic partners like the Northwest Commission to support clients in our 13 county footprint. So Aaron Gam, thank you for letting us um, just talk a little bit about what we do at the IRC. And again, we're here to support small and mid-sized manufacturers within our 13 county footprint. Thanks, Aaron. 
Thank you very much, Lisa. And my apologies for your last name. My inner American came out and I just read it like I saw it. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So now we will hear from Corey of the Penn West Clarion SBDC. Corey, I will stop my share so you can share your slides. There we go. Corey, you're still muted. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Let's try this again. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to everybody about the Small Business Development Center. And um, you know, a key takeaway about the SBDC is that we are a business consulting organization that uh, offers you know, business consulting, education through webinars and training, through research that we offer. Uh, it's all one-on-one -on -one business consulting. So we'll come to you. We can do it via Zoom, by telephone, by email, whatever might work for you. Um, we offer lots of webinars, lots of seminars uh, that we uh, offer our, ourselves, and then others that we partner with and with other uh, organizations, such as we are today. Uh, and most of those seminars and webinars are offered at, at no charge. Um, some of the uh, business consulting that we can help you out with deals with uh, business planning, especially for those looking to start a small business. And then once you're in business, we can help you out with human resources, marketing, uh, bookkeeping. Uh, I'm a QuickBooks Pro advisor, so I have a little bit of, I uh, should say, quite a bit of experience with QuickBooks. I won't say I know it all, but I know some of it. Um, and again, all of this is offered at no charge. We also have different types of databases that we can subscribe to. So if you're a business looking to sell to other businesses, we have uh, a database that basically has mostly every business in the uh, in the country uh, in it that we can provide to you via spreadsheet and you can use it for marketing purposes. Um, and then we are located throughout Pennsylvania. So there are 16 centers and we're also located throughout the United States. So if you know friends or family that have businesses throughout the country, reach out to us as well. We've been in, uh, we've been an organization uh, for over, uh, over, over 40 years now. Um, we also are a part of the WedNet PA program that offers uh, training dollars for uh, manufacturing companies, especially, and some other industries as well. Uh, there are um, contacts for WedNet PA throughout Pennsylvania. We're just one of them. So feel free to reach out if you're looking uh, for any assistance in training your employees that you have. Um, Last but not least, feel free to reach out to us anytime uh, where we have a 10 county territory that was on that Pennsylvania map. Um, but if you just go to the internet and, and you'll see the website down at the bottom, you can do a Google search as well, looking for a small business development center in Pennsylvania, and you'll find your local SBDC in your area. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Corey. I appreciate you taking the time to come out and talk to us about the SBDC. Alrighty, so we are going to get move, moving on just a little bit, if I move here. Okay, so just to give you guys a bit of an overview about what today's presentation is going to be covering. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about a little bit about the PTAC program, what is a PTAC, and Barb Brennan from the North Central P PA PTAC will be giving a presentation on that. Um, then we're going to move and talk about why are we talking about small disadvantaged businesses in the first place? Why are we having this webinar? Um, and that'll go into a little bit of recent both federal and state initiatives. And when I say state, I'm referring to Pennsylvania. Um, recent initiatives that they've announced on us uh, increasing supplier diversity and the pro and kind of some tweaks and overhauls to the programs that they've had. Um, then we're going to be talking about the federal government's small disadvantaged business program. And then we're going to move on to Pennsylvania's programs, which are the disadvantaged business enterprise and small diverse business programs. So without further ado, Bob Brennan, I will turn I will turn the screen over to you. And you, you can talk a little bit about what is a P what we can offer you guys. Thanks, Aaron. Good morning. Get my my screen up. So, can everybody hear me? Okay. I can hear you just fine, Barb. Okay, great. I, I can hear you as well. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, good morning, and thank you for attending our webinar on the small disadvantaged business requirements 
for federal and state contracting. And I'd like to just give a brief overview of the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers. And again, welcome and we appreciate you attending. Uh, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center is a nationwide network of procurement professionals working to bridge a gap between the buyer and the supplier. There are 96 PTACs across the U.S. all working towards the same goal of providing technical assistance to the interested supplier. Here is the eight counties that are represented by the Northwest Commission. And again, I'm showing them again for representation on, on the map of uh, Pennsylvania. North Central six county area is part of a partnership consisting of North Central, Southern Allegheny Planning and Development Commission, and Northern Tier Planning and Development Commission. And the map shows the representation of the areas of the counties. So here's a brief view of what we are. We're a bridge between the business and government, funded by federal government, Department of Defense, Office of Small Business Programs, and the State Prep Partnership for Regional Economic Performance Program. We're matching funds, which enables us to be to provide our services for free. We serve a geographical area, and we serve business of all kinds, and we are assigned a geographical area. And here's a list of some of the services and resources. We assess vendor for government contracting. We assist with registration certifications. We identify government market and specific contracting opportunities. We help prepare bid proposals. And we have post word contract performance. <clears throat> we conduct educational workshops. We have free bid match services and specs and standards. We provide you with knowledge tools to successfully compete, and the goal is to win government contracts. And the PTAX can also assist with registration certifications. Um, so here's a list of some of them. Uh, we have help with the system for award management. We help with the PA supplier registration and the PA small business certification. We help assist with the 88 certification, the hub zone certification. The women owned small business and the economically disadvantaged women owned small business certification. The veteran owned small business certification and the service disabled veteran owned small business certification. So, and here's a list of some of the things that we are not able to do. We cannot provide general business or marketing assistance. We cannot write or submit proposals or bids. We cannot determine or advise on pricing matters and we cannot market on the client's behalf. So why would you wanna to sell to the government? The US government is the largest purchaser of goods and services in the world. In the fiscal year of 2021, the federal government spent over $24 billion on buying millions of items while assisting thousands of businesses. Local, state, and federal governments can be potentially lucrative markets for your company, and the government can be a loyal customer. The bottom line is we are here to help. I have the contact information here for the Northwest Commission of all three of them. And then here is the North Central contact information. I've also provided Southern Alleghenies and Northern Tier since we are in a partnership with them. So thank you. Alrighty, thank you. Let me oh, let me see, make certain everything was going all right. Okay, thank you very much, Barb. I really appreciate that. Okay, so one thing, real quick, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the rest of the Northwest Commission. So here is um, our team here at the Northwest Commission PTAC. We have our fearless leader, Robin Young. Uh, my colleague, Melissa Becker, and myself, although I am significantly beardier now. Um, we each have different service regions, like uh, Barb said, that we take. So Robin handles within our eight county service region. Uh, Robin handles Erie and Warren County. Melissa handles Clarion, Crawford, and Lawrence. And I am in charge of Forest, Mercer, and Venango. A little bit about the other programs that are available at the Northwest Commission. And Barb, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that um, the other local development districts at the 
Pennsylvania PTACs are hosted by, they have services that are similar to this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yep. So if you have, so even if you are outside our eight county service region, if you're more from Barb's region or another region, you should be able to access services similar to this. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about what all of these are just because they're not my area of expertise, but I've listed the contact information for all of the program heads. So if you see anything on these next couple of slides, or if you know that you're interested in, or you know someone who would be interested, um, you can shoot them an email, give them a call, and they can help you out. Okay, so getting into the meat of the presentation. Now, typically, this is where I'd start def by defining what a small disadvantaged business is. But uh, part of what makes this such a complicated issue is that the definition of being disadvantaged or diverse varies based on whether you're talking about federal or state contracting. We'll talk about um, and cover the definitions as we go along, but for now I want to delve into why we're talking about small disadvantaged businesses, small diverse businesses, why are we having this webinar in the first place. And I'm going to be breaking this down into federal and state initiatives, and when I say state from here on out I'm referring to Pennsylvania. Okay, talking about the federal government first. So um, on January 20th, 2021, uh, President Biden signed Executive Order 13985, advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. That executive order had um, multiple different parts to it, but the part that pertains to government contracting was Section 5B. And Section 5B of that executive order directed federal agencies to identify barriers to underserved communities in government contracting. And that effort is going to be coordinated and spearheaded by the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB for short. So essentially, because of this executive order, each agency had to work with the director of the OMB to evaluate their procurement practices, figure out what, um, what pain points or barriers there are to um, businesses from these underserved communities, um, what is stopping them from contract or making it more difficult for them to contract with their agency and figure out how to um, solve some of those problems, um, ease their way and just help to bring them into the fold and let them get a piece of the, I believe actually it's hundreds of billions of dollars that the government spends on contracts every year. So um, another initiative that happened on June 1st, 2021, the president announced a plan to increase the share of contracting dollars going to small disadvantaged businesses, SDBs for short, to 15% by 2025. So prior to this announcement, the goal for small disadvantaged business utilization was only 5%. With that being said, though, as of fiscal year 2020, which is the fiscal year for which we have the most, that, that's the last year we have contracting data for, takes a while to, for the data to come down the pipeline. As of fiscal year 2020, 10.45% um, of government contracting dollars went to small disadvantaged businesses. So by 2025, they're looking to triple the goal for small disadvantaged businesses and increase the actual utilization of them by almost 50%. So on December 2nd, 2021, the Office of Management and Budget issued Memorandum M-22-03, which formally implemented that plan. So for fiscal year 2022, it set a government-wide goal of 11% of contracting dollars should go to small disadvantaged businesses. Now, that doesn't mean that government wide there's an 11% goal because of course it's 11% of total contracting dollars and some agencies have bigger or smaller budgets than others. For example, the Department of Defense has a much larger budget than the Department of Interior, for example. So the SBA is going to, is, I should say, is currently working and will be continue to be working with the heads of those agencies to set individual goals. Now, some of these agencies, their goal might be higher than 11%. 
Some of them might be lower. It all depends on that agency's particular circumstances. A couple other changes that M-22-03 made. It disaggregated the top line reporting data for government contracting by race and business size. So the government can more easily see if there is a particular socioeconomic group that is lagging in contract utilization. It also implemented some reforms to category management so that government buyers got more credit for using firms that fall under socioeconomic categories for their contracts. Now, if you're not familiar what con category management is, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of it. It's a system that the government has been very high on as of late in which an agency um, buys as a, if there is a, um, if there is a requirement for um, materials or services that the agency needs across their different offices, the agency would buy those as a single entity instead of a bunch of different purchasing departments. And that was made to take advantage of economies of scale, as well as cut down on um, a bunch of disparate things like avoiding having 11 different products across the agency that are all working to solve the same problem. The issue with that being that, of course, when you get into your ordering such a large amount, you're ordering, some, say, pencils for an entire agency, um, smaller businesses might not be able to get that enough for them. So it was almost disincentivizing um, agencies from ordering from smaller and small disadvantaged businesses. So they made it so that in, so, and government buyers would get credit for um, certain actions like this. So they made it so that um, buying from different socioeconomic categories of businesses now gets them automatic, what's called tier two credit. So it helps to um, incentivize the government buyers to contract with these small disadvantaged businesses. And they also made it so that in, reaching those utilization goals for small disadvantaged businesses are a part of their sen the agency's senior leadership evaluation criteria. Moving on to Pennsylvania, need to go back a couple of years because this has really been um, kind of a building effort over the last few years. Back in November 21st of 2011, Governor Corbett created the Small Business Procurement Initiative. Now, Prior to the Small Business Procurement Initiative, the state didn't track how much of its procurement dollars went to small businesses because it had no guidelines for what a small business was. So the SBPI instructed the Department of General Services, DGS for short, and it instructed them to create a definition for a small business based off of employee numbers and average yearly revenue and work to set goals for contracting based on those standards. They also had to develop guidelines for how state agencies should identify contracts that can be awarded for small businesses. What are we already buying that would be a good fit that we think small businesses would be able to fulfill? Um, they also worked to develop policies for alternative and reduced bonding requirements, as well as faster payment on contracts because um, from their research, those were identified as two of the biggest barriers to small businesses entering um, and participating in state government contracting. It also worked to create a system to monitor and report on how the program was doing, just so if in case, hey, this isn't working, we can tweak and course correct as necessary. I've broken the next few initiatives down into a table just for e ease of reading. So in first initiative, second initiative technically, in 2015, um, September 23rd, Governor Wolf signed Executive Order 2015-11. So it created an advisory council on diversity, inclusion, and small business opportunities and directed that council to look into ways to increase contracting from both small and small diverse businesses. It also renamed the Bureau of Small Business Opportunities to the Bureau of Diversity, Inclusion, and Small Business Opportunities. Now we just call it BDISBO because that's way too much, way too long of a title. 
And that um, advisory council eventually led to Pennsylvania's first statewide disparity study. So this disparity study was created to analyze the disparity between the availability of small diverse businesses to perform government contracting and the actual utilization of them. So the difference between how many small diverse businesses could have supplied the goods and services the state needed versus how many small diverse businesses the state government actually awarded contracts to. And it did that by analyzing procurement data from between July 1st, 2011 to June 30th, 2016. Um, the, state, the study made a number of suggestions. I will link to that study on the next slide if you really wanna take a look at it. But essentially the state government's response was to update its aspirational goals for small, small diverse and veteran business usage. And again, we'll talk about that on the next slide. It also began setting mandatory subcontracting goals for state procurements of over $250,000 or $300,000 if you're talking about construction contracts. And it also worked to reinvigorate the Small Business Reserve Program so that they could set aside procurements so that they could only be bid on by small businesses, similar to the Small Business Set Aside Program that the federal government uses. Um, and those subcontracting goals that I talked about for state procurements of over $250,000, those are going to be set on a case-by-case -case basis based off of market research and a mathematical analysis that was included in the disparity study. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what they mean by small diverse businesses and how that differs from small dis disadvantaged businesses later when we discuss Pennsylvania supplier diversity programs. Last thing, I'm not going to spend as much time on this because this isn't law yet, but just to give you guys an idea of what might be coming down the pike soon. Uh, Senate Bill 900, it's currently working its way through the Pennsylvania legislature. And if it was passed and signed by the governor, it would call for a disparity study to be completed every five years just to help keep the aspirational targets up to date. It would legislatively establish the Bureau of the Bidisbo's Goal Setting Program. It would formally establish a minimum small diverse business participation and spending commitment levels. And it would also change the Pennsylvania state government's small business size standards to an industry by industry basis. Right now they have one, uh, they, they only have one standard that is applied across all industries which puts it in conflict with the federal government's uh, size standards, which are determined on an industry by industry basis based on that in that company's primary NAICS code. And that can cause some confusion as we'll talk about later. So here is the state government's contracting goals as laid out in their announcement, um, their response rather to the diversity study. So as of fiscal year, as of the 2017, 2018 fiscal year, they only had about 4.37% of contracts go, dollars going to small businesses, 6.54 going to small diverse and 0.41 going to veteran businesses. So their aspirational goals was to designate 15% of agency spend on the small business reserve program. They wanna have 26.3% going to small diverse businesses and they wanna have 4.6% going to veteran business enterprises. Now I will say the state has made progress on this front. As of fiscal year 2019, the total percentage of Pennsylvania government's spending for small, small diverse and veteran businesses was totaled to about 17.9%. So I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now, but are there any questions that anyone has on any of these initiatives before we proceed? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So we're just going to move along. Okay, so now we are going to talk about the federal government's small disadvantaged business program. So here's a $64,000 question. 
what does the federal government consider a small disadvantaged business? Well, the definition comes from the Code of Federal Regulations or CFR for short. In 13 CFR 124.1001, it states that to be considered a small disadvantaged business, um, you need to be considered small under the NAICS code of the solicitation you're responding to and each NAICS code. Um, if you're not familiar, the SBA on their website has an, it has an interactive database of those NAICS codes and what the Small Business Administration size standards for those NAICS codes are. For manufacturing companies, it'll typically be based on your number of employees. Service companies, it will be based off of your um, average annual revenue. But anyway, getting back on topic, to be considered small, you have to be small under the NAICS code of the contract in question, your of the solicitation you're responding to, and your firm has to be owned and controlled by one or more socially and economically disadvantaged individuals, DIs for short. We'll get into the specifics of these in just a little bit, but for now, suffice to say that it's the social and economic disadvantage part of that that really trips people up. Also, these guidelines aren't stated in the CFR code I referenced, but per 13 CFR 124.102, to be considered any kind of small business, you need to be small under your primary NAICS code in SAM as well. And the owner of the company also needs to be of good character and a U.S. citizen. That is per 13 CFR 124.108 and 124.101, respectively. I'll get into these um, specific requirements right now. So being of good character can be subjective. But normal guidelines are that you can't be suspended or debarred from federal contracting. You can't have been indicted or worse <laughs> for any business integrity crimes like fraud or embezzlement. Um, you can't be actively incarcerated on probation or parole. And you also can't have any significant federal debts that don't have a, a payment plan in place to ameliorate them. Um, and you do have to be a born US citizen. Unfortunately, naturalized citizens and permanent residents don't count for this program don't qualify, I should say. Also, whenever we are talking about size under these NAICS codes, general disclaimer, all of the normal affiliation rules that are listed in 13 CFR 121 apply. You can really get into the weeds talking about affiliation. I have seen some very long PowerPoint presentations on it, on the topic rather. So I won't really be getting into that right now, but if you have any questions, um, shoot your PTAC counsel or an email, give us a call, and we'll get those questions answered for you. Also, second disclaimer, when we are talking about small disadvantaged businesses, there are companies such as Alaska Native Corporations, Native Hawaiian Organizations, Native American Tribes, and uh, what are called community development corporations that have their own rules when it comes to being disadvantaged. Those are what are colloquially referred to as super 8A firms. I'm not going to be talking about them or their exceptions here just because being in Northwest and North Central Pennsylvania, um, I kind of doubt that I don't think that any of those really apply. I don't think there, there are any of those set up around here. But if I'm wrong, and if you have any questions about them, again, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll get those questions answered for you. Okay, now we are going to move on to what the requirements for being a small disadvantaged business are. And we're going to be diving into a little more detail about each of the requirements and what they mean. So here is the government's definition for social disadvantage. We're gonna take that on first. And this definition comes directly from 13 CFR 124.103. Someone a uh, socially disadvantaged individual means an individual that has persistently experienced racial, cultural, or ethnic bias within American society without any regard for their individual qualities and stemming from circumstances beyond their control. And there are a list of, of ethnicities that have a presumed social disadvantage. I've taken a snip of those ethnicities and I've listed them over on the right. So if you are a Black American, Hispanic American, 
Native American, Asian Pacific American, or subcontinent Asian American, you automatically qualify in the eyes of the federal government as having a social disadvantage. Now, if, you, if, you'll, if you're reading that, you'll notice there's something individual dash concern other than one of the preceding, and we will talk about that right now. So what if I am not on that list? Well, if even if you are not on that list, you can still be considered socially disadvantaged for the purpose of this program, but individuals without a presumed disadvantage have to meet all of these four criteria. Number one, um, the individual has to have an objective distinguishing feature that contributed to their disadvantage. Um, the bias or discrimination that they've experienced has to have been experienced in American society. If someone was really rude to you in Ireland, it doesn't count. Um, that disadvantage has to be chronic and substantial, not fleeting, occasional, or small. And that disadvantage must have impeded your entry into or your advancement in American society. And for the SBA to grant these exceptions, all of those criteria have to be supported by a preponderance of evidence. Now, when I say preponderance of evidence, it means that there's evidence of sufficient quality and quantity that would lead the reviewer from the SBA to conclude that your claim is more likely to be true than it is to not be true. Excuse me. Um, one example that I've heard from before, heard before rather, is from a government contracting attorney named Stephen Coprince. He does a lot of trainings and such with the PTAC program. And the one example he has is he mentioned a Vietnam era veteran that he represented, and he was able to get that person certified as socially disadvantaged because of course, unfortunately, following the Vietnam War, our country was not always kind to the men who fought in it. But keep in mind that even though the SBA can grant these exceptions, they are rare and the process of proving them can be pretty arduous. The reason Stephen Coprince has that example in his back pocket is that this guy had this Vietnam era veteran had to seek out legal, legal counsel from an attorney that specializes in government contracting matters to get his social disadvantage proven. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll always need to go that far, but it is a consideration to make. That is how complicated this process can get how complicated and involved it can be, I should say. So keep that in the back of your mind. Moving on to economic disadvantage. Um, so economic disadvantage is a little more straightforward. It's determined by net worth and income tests per 13 CFR 124.104. So first test is you have to have a three-year average adjusted gross income on your IRS tax paperwork under $350,000. Um, that will exclude any S Corp or LLC income used to reinvest in the business or pay the business taxes. It'll also include one-time income that's unlikely to reoccur, such as inheritances or winning the lottery. And it'll also discount your spousal and spouse's income unless your spouse has a role in the business. You'll also have to have an adjusted net worth below $750,000 and that is excluding any equity in your primary residence, equity in your small disadvantaged business company, most retirement funds, and again, any money used to reinvest in the company or pay company taxes. Um, your unadjusted net worth also has to fall below $6 million, and that's going to exclude um, only your retirement accounts. And as a quick disclaimer for all of these income tests, any assets or debts that are jointly owned, but between you and your spouse are going to be evaluated at 50% unless there's any special circumstances. Moving on to ownership and control. So disadvantaged individuals, that is the person who meets the requirements for social and economic disadvantage, has to have unconditional and direct control of at least 51% of the company. Now, direct ownership means personal ownership. The ownership can't be through a parent or holding company, although there are certain exceptions for specific revocable trusts. Um, subsidiaries of small disadvantaged businesses um, aren't eligible for SDB status of their own. Um, and unconditional means unlimited ownership with no restrictions on ownership or the ability to dispose of stocks, 
with exceptions for agreements dealing with death or incapacity of the owner and the pledging of stock as collateral. Now, a word of warning, unconditional ownership can be a very difficult proposition to prove if a company is set up as a partnership. So if you're looking at forming a company and you think that you're, or you already have a company that's set up as a partnership, um, you may want to think about either not going after this or possibly adjusting your business structure if it's something you feel is really, if you feel like this STB program is really worth it for you to go after. Now we're going to talk about the control component of being an SDB. So disadvantaged individuals need to unconditionally control the big picture and day-to-day decision-making. And when I say big picture control, I mean the strategic policy control typically exercised by a board of directors. Um, and this is per 13 CFR 124.106. If a company has a board, the disadvantaged individual has to control that board. Um, and the government document, governing documents of the business also need to show that a disadvantaged individual holds the highest officer position. And word of warning, make certain that you are consistent in staying in line with what those documents say. If the governing documents Say, if the corporate paperwork says that your highest officer position is a CEO, you can't go around referring to yourself as a president. You need to make certain that your day-to-day -day business operations are consistent with the um, corporate paperwork that governs your business. So the person who holds that highest officer position also needs to have sufficient managerial experience to um, justify them controlling the company. They have to devote full time to the business during the normal working hours for the industry. And of course, that'll be determined on a case by case basis. And with certain exceptions, the highest, you, the disadvantaged individual who holds the highest officer position has to be the highest compensated. And that's all compensation, including salary, bonuses, and dividends. And I put that in asterisks because an ordinary employee can be paid more if it's for legitimate business reasons. If the market for a particular skill is very tight, so you need to feel like you need to pay above normal market value to ensure you get a top tier employee, someone who can do whatever you need them to do, that can be admissible. But in general, you want to make certain that um, you don't have someone who is a minority owner in the business being paid more than the disadvantaged individual who is the majority owner in highest officer position. There's also a presumption that a disadvantaged individual doesn't control the company. If a current or former employer or principal of the DI is involved in company ownership or management, and when I say principal, I don't mean the person whose office you were afraid to get sent to during elementary school. I mean someone who is, for example, a, um, a board of director uh, on the board of directors or an investor in a company you are currently working for or used to sit for used to work for, rather. Um, the SBA can also find that, dis that a disadvantaged individual doesn't have control if a non-disadvantaged individual has provided critical financial support or licensure for the business, or if the company is financially dependent on a particular business relationship. If 80% of, of your business comes from one particular customer, you are in your own way beholden to them because if you do something and make them mad and then they take all the business away, your business will more or less be guaranteed to fold. So you have to be very careful about what those business relationships are because not every um, dependent business relationship comes in a legitimately spelled out contract. So again, just things to keep in mind. Okay, so now that we know what a small disadvantaged business is, what does being a small disadvantaged business get you? What program does the federal government have for these companies? So the federal government's SDB program is entirely self-certified. You don't need to submit documentation or go through a formal review process. You just say that you're a small disadvantaged business when you get to question 17 of your SAM renewal. Just check that little box. Um, now, the SBA used to formally certify SDBs, and back when this program started in 1987, there also used to be 
set asides for SDBs and a 10% price preference, uh, similar to the hub zone program. But over time, parts of that law got struck down in the courts. And so this is what we're working with now. The sole benefit of the program is that the government and large prime contractors get credit for both giving you contracts or subcontracting to you respectively. Now the government has the goals that I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the executive orders. And, but for prime contractors who are looking to subcontract, any contracts that are over $750,000 will typically have small disadvantaged business subcontracting goals that they have to work to try and um, attain. Um, now, the SDB is essentially a self-certified 8A firm, um, and it's kind of a weird situation. So all participants in the 8A program are automatically considered small disadvantaged businesses, but not all small disadvantaged businesses are considered 8As because the 8A program has a couple of differences. They, 8A firms typically have to be in business for at least two years, and they have to go through a very lengthy formal certification process, including tests on um, whether or not their business is commercially viable moving forward. Being an 8A firm also has some other advantages. There's a lot of business development assistance that comes with it. There's 8A set-aside contracts. But here's the thing, both self-certified SDBs and 8As count towards the federal government's small disadvantaged business subcontracting goals, but only the self-certified SDBs count for subcontracting goals. So just keep that in mind. Again, weird little thing. And if you're wondering why the SDB program got, got um, judicially sliced and diced in the courts, whereas the 8A program is still going strong, could not tell you. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. I just play one on the stage occasionally. But if you're really interested, you can ask Google or talk to a government contracting attorney because I have no idea. Okay, but moving on. Okay, so here's the other $64,000 question. Should your company self-certify as an SDB? Well, Certifying will help you in general because both the government and the large prime contractors are going to be looking for um, SDB companies to help them meet their targets. But the primary government is still as a subcontractor because the primes can't use 8A firms for their SDB goals. So they have a much, they have a smaller pool to work to pull from. Um, if you believe in good faith that you're eligible as an SDB, you've done your research, you're well informed, and you really believe that you're eligible for this, you can either self-certify in SAM like we already talked about, or you can put your status in writing and send it to a prime contractor. Um, it's advisable though that if you do self-certify with this program, have documentation ready to go to back up your certification for reasons we'll talk about in just a little bit. But if the advantages aren't useful to you or you're not eligible, don't self-certify. Moving on to enforcement and potential penalties regarding this program. So this statistic was really the impetus for my creating this training. I'm still in my first year here at the PTAC. I've got about eight months in, and I have already seen multiple companies that are self-certified as SDBs when unless they had a strong enough case for a waiver, they probably didn't qualify for it. Um, this was the statistic that I saw. Again, this was coming from Stephen Coprince. Um, there are around 125,000 SDBs in SAM, but only around 10,000 of them are 8A firms, and many of them are probably ineligible. Now, here, as far as enforcement goes, FAR 19.305, which if you're not familiar with the FAR, it's kind of like the... Um, government contracting Bible. It lays out exactly what um, government procurement officers and government contractors have to do. Um, so FAR 19.305 does allow the SBA to initiate a review of the firm's SDB status if they get credible information calling that status into question. However, because there are no set-asides for the program, they generally don't get many referrals. But if they do, um, false claims can lead to liability under the False Claims Act, terminated contracts, or suspension and debarment 
if it's part of the liability, especially if it is part of willful fraud. Um, and the SBA is currently looking at regulation to enforce a review process and more clearly define their guidelines of what an SDB is. If that sounds vague, it's because it is and they're still working on it. Um, rest assured, as soon as you guys, as soon as we know, we will be putting out information so you guys can know as well. Okay, and so I think now is a good time to stop. Does anyone have any questions about the federal SDB program? Not seeing any. Okay, so we shall move right along into the Pennsylvania's state government programs, DBE and small diverse business now. First up, oh, Sherry, uh, Sherry Main raised her hand. Sherry, you want to put your question in the chat? Or do you feel like, or would you rather I unmute you? Oh, hand went down, so. Okay, we'll just go ahead, Sherry. If you are still interested, go ahead and, oh, Sherry, do you want to, do you want me to unmute you, Sherry? Here, I'll just unmute you so you can talk. Um, I'm not. Ahead? I'm not able to access the chat. It says um, recording on and chat is disabled. Oh, that's strange. I haven't seen that before. I apologize, Sherry. Okay, so go ahead. What's your question? Um, I believe you went over this. I had to step away for a minute. I have a toddler here. Uh, <laughs> no worries. What was what was the um, the net worth? of the company to be SDB eligible? Net worth had to be, um, let me actually here, I can just go back to the actual thing because there's a couple different net worth ones. See which one you were referring to. Okay, so net worth is below $750,000, and that excludes any equity in your primary residence, any equity in the company, most retirement funds, and any money that you've used to reinvest in your company or pay company taxes. Okay, yeah, that's, that's all interest. I wanted uh, for okay. now. But uh, again, the chat is disabled for some reason. Okay, so I, I everyone, I apologize for that. So New, new rule moving forward. If you have any questions, um, go ahead and there should be a raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so go ahead and raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can ask your questions through this. And Melissa is going to be working on getting the chat on getting the chat working. She's a panelist, so she should be able to, fingers crossed, she'll be able to do that. But okay, thank you very much, Sarah. If you could re-mute, I would appreciate it, and we'll move on. Okay, so talking about the DBE program. So DBE stands for Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, um, and it was established by, in March of 1999 by 49 CFR Part 26. So idea behind the DBE program Oh, Melissa, you just unmuted. Do you have something for everyone? Oh, I did not. Sorry about that. It's all good. Just wanted to make sure. Okay, so any money that any, um, as per Part 49 CFR Part 26, all of the states in the United States have to set DBE participation goals for all of their contracts if they are funded by the Federal Transit Administration, Federal Aviation Administration, or the Federal Highway Administration. Um, now, there is another program similar to the DBE called the Airport Concession Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. And that program seeks to increase the number of businesses located at airports owned by disadvantaged individuals. Um, the, they're more or less identical. The certification requirements and the processes are identical. They're just for a different type of business. Airport concessions, again, are for companies um, looking to be um, 
operating at the airports. The regular DBE program deals with more um, road construction and infrastructure projects. But the, again, they're exactly identical. So moving forward, anything that I say about the DBE will also apply to the ACDBE program, um, just for different types of business. And the ACDBE program was established by 49 CFR Part 23, um, not um, Part 26. So keep that in mind moving forward. Oh, the goals, those DBE participation goals, they are going to be set individually per contract based on market research by that state's Department of Transportation. And the prime contractor has to work to execute those goals. So they either have to um, hit what is called a minimum participation level, subcontract out a certain amount of their that contract to small to dot disadvantaged business enterprises, or they have to make a documented good faith effort to find them and show the government, hey, we tried, we just got, we really genuinely tried, we just couldn't find anyone. Okay, so DBE requirements. This is where it starts to get a little confusing. Starts out, the requirements to be a DBE start out pretty similar. Company has to be a for-profit entity that is at least 51% owned and controlled by one or more socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. But we see our first major difference in that the disadvantaged individuals can be permanent residents. They don't have to be born in the United States. They don't have to be born US citizens. And then we get down to the list of socially disadvantaged groups. And the major change is that in addition to the list of um, individuals with a presumed social disadvantage that we read before, women are considered socially disadvantaged for the purpose of this program. So a woman-owned company can be considered a disadvantaged business enterprise, but it cannot be considered a small disadvantaged business. Welcome to government contracting. This is why we are here to help you. Um, so economic disadvantage is a little different as well. So the disadvantaged individual has to have a personal net worth of under $1.32 million. And the business has to meet the SBA size standards for small businesses. Again, that's just based on the NAICS code. You can look that up on the SBA's website. And it can't exceed $28.48 million in five-year average gross annual receipts. So certifying as a DBE. So certification is free. And in Pennsylvania, it is managed by the Pennsylvania Unified Certification Program, or PAUCP for short. There's five certifying agencies. I've listed them below. We generally recommend the Allegheny County's Department of Equity and Inclusion here at the Northwest Commission PTAC, since the office is the closest to our service area. But I will say that the last time I talked to them, helping a client with a complete with a sim with a related matter. They said that they're a little short staffed right now and so their applications are taking longer than normal and they recommended you go to the Allegheny County Port Authority because they're better staffed and um, hope so hopefully they'll be able to get the sort of get your uh, certification done quicker and their office is only two blocks from the Allegheny County's main office so there's you know just so you know um, that may have changed recently, not certain, but just to let you know. Um, there's no difference between the certification processes. All, a certification by any one of these five agencies is going to be accepted throughout the state, and the process is identical across the board. Just the people you're dealing with will be a little different. Okay, so certification process and advantages. So talking about being becoming certified as a DBE. So companies need to submit a notarized certification application as well as a personal net worth statement. And there's also going to be a checklist on that certification application of supporting documentation that you need to send in. Now know that when I'm discussing forms and documents, those can be mailed in or submitted electronically. Just make certain that you attach all of the documents that they ask for. Um, your certifying agency may ask for additional information or clarification information, clarifying information during the review, just to give you a heads up. Um, after the initial review, there will be an on-site review that will occur at your business location. Um, and that's just to make certain that your day-to-day -day operations line up with the um, 
line up with what it says on your business documents. Um, you, let's see here. Okay, so after the location review, there are the on-site report and any additional documents that they ask you for, those will be evaluated to determine and the office will make a final determination on your eligibility. Um, you'll renew your certification yearly, but you don't have to go through the entire process again. You'll send in an annual affidavit along with copies of your most recent federal tax returns to your certifying office. And if there's a major change in your business size, financial situation, ownership or business structure, you'll need to submit what's called a notice of change affidavit and supporting documents within 30 days of the change. And I apologize everyone, but I need to stop really briefly and duck out for a second. I will be back in a minute. This is uh, Robin Young, a program manager here for the PTAC. I apologize for the delay. Um, I believe Aaron will be back here shortly. I'm not sure exactly what is going on. He must have had something happen with his system. Um, please be patient. Hold on here. We'll be finishing up shortly. So again, uh, Aaron. I'm back. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Okay. So moving. Robin, did you want to finish anything or can we move right along? You can move along, Aaron. I was just, uh, just kind of filling the, the blank space for a little bit while you were you were gone. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so moving on to, uh, oh, quick thing before we move on to the certification advantages. If you are denied for your um, for, for your application, you can either request an appeal to the PAUCP Appeal Committee or you can take it straight to the Department of Transportation's Office of Civil Rights. That was something I did not know existed before I was researching for this, but there you go. Okay, so certification advantages. Now, as I said, there are um, DB, as we already talked about, there are DBE goals set for any contracts that have that federal money from those three agencies attached to it. You also get um, statewide marketing opportunities through the PAUCP website. There is a, um, on the website for the, they maintain a database of all of the DBEs. So any company that is looking to um, subcontract out business um, will be able to search that website and find you. 
The state also hosts a variety of networking opportunities throughout the year for the DBEs. And you're allowed to promote your DBE certification on your official company letterhead. And you can also more easily certify with other states unified certification programs now. It's a little strange, the PAUC, even though this is a federally mandated um, program, the PAUCP doesn't have direct reciprocity with other states' UCPs, but the Department of Transportation's guidance says that a company that's certified in its home state isn't required to start all over again when applying for DBE status in another state. So you'll have to complete a DBE or slash ACDBE interstate certification checklist affidavit and get it notarized and send it to that state's unified certification program, and then you'll be easily approved. And so, for example, if you're working in Northwest Pennsylvania and you want to maybe do some in infrastructure contracting in Eastern Ohio, you can more easily get, get certified as a DBE in that state as well. You also get access to the DBE Supportive Services Center. Um, the DBE Supportive Services Center is run by ProRank Business Solutions. They are very good at what they do. Um, great, very sharp group of people. They've done some events with us before. So if you are a DBE, um, I would highly recommend contacting them and checking out their website because they're very. there's a variety of services they offer and they're very good at what they do. And you can also use your DBE certification for your small diverse business certification. Oh, sorry, Zoom went a little weird. Speaking of, so here are the requirements to be considered a small diverse business. Now, you'll notice that the first thing is um, you, can, you have to be for-profit, independently owned, not dominant within your field and when I say not dominant, think of how dominant Google is to the search engine industry. Um, but here's the thing. You'll notice that the size standards are different from the federal ones. And this is what Senate Bill 900 is kind of looking to rectify. So Pennsylvania lays down a blanket rule that to be considered small, you have to have less than 100 full-time employees and less than $38.5 in gross annual revenue. Um, You'll also notice that Pennsylvania considers a company to be diverse if it's owned or operated, excuse me, by a minority a woman, a service disabled veteran, a person with a disability, or a member of the LGBT community. Now, normal veteran owned businesses aren't considered to be diverse, but the state does have a veteran business enterprise program that they fall under. And, Again, this is why I wanted to have this training because it gets pretty confusing. You can be a small diverse business in the eyes of the Pennsylvania government and not be considered a small disadvantaged business in the eyes of the federal government. And the inverse could be true as well because especially because of the different size standards that Pennsylvania has right now. So you could be a you could have 250 employees and be considered a small disadvantaged business if you're a manufacturer. But because of Pennsylvania size standards, by the same token, you wouldn't qualify as small or even sm or small diverse or even small by Pennsylvania standards. And again, this is why we're here. This we're here to help you navigate all of this. So, how do you get certified as a small diverse business? Well, first you'll need to be registered in the PA supplier portal. And then you'll need to obtain a third party certification. And I've attached a full list on the right. The PA UCP certification that we talked about before, that counts. There is a number of other third party certifying entities as well. Um, every at least once a year, we ask the PA Department of General Services, you kind of administer this program. Um, hey, when are you going to be offer? Um, when are you going to accept the SBA's women-owned small business certification towards this? Because that's another free option. That would be another free option for you guys to get certified. We bank right now, they charge, I believe it's $350 for certification. And every year they say, we're looking at it, we're working on it. So just so you guys know, that isn't an option right now, but hopefully eventually it will come about. 
Um, that certification is done through the PA Bedisbo's PRISM website. That's also where you certify as a small business. You can go through the application and just attach your small disadvantaged business thing at the end, diverse business um, certification at the end rather. If you're interested, we can help you with this application. We can typically get clients through it in about 30 to 45 minutes. And both certifications as a small business and small diverse business, those get renewed every two years. So here's the advantages of being a small diverse business. Number one, you're in, your company is included on the Department of General Services Small Business Search website. Um, and again, that's just more free marketing for you for you guys. If there's either the government or a prime contractor is looking to contract slash subcontract with you, they can find you on there. Um, the state and prime contractors get gold credit for contracting and subcontracting with you. So it just makes you a little bit more attractive. And the and of course, as we already talked about, all state contracts over two hundred fifty thousand dollars or three hundred thousand for construction come with utilization goals for small, diverse, and veteran business enterprises. Um, those goals, by the way, are set. Uh, those are from a uh, a response to the PA diversity study, and the calculation for what those goals are is based off of the scope of work for the solicitation. Uh, line item breakdown of how much money is going to be spent, the location the work's performed in, and the percentage of DGS verified small diverse businesses that are, that are available to do the work. And that percentage comes from the disparity study. You'll also have access to the PA Diverse Business Financing Initiative. That's a loan program administered through the Bucks County Economic Development Corporation. It can provide up to $100,000 for land or building acquisitions, any construction or renovation projects you need, uh, working capital or just equipment. So if you are certified as a small diverse business and you're looking for some good financing, that is an option for you. And you also get access to the Diverse Business Supportive Service Center, which is run by Again, pro rank Business Solutions, same great group of people that runs the DBE Supportive Services Center. Um, and so make if you're a small diverse business, make sure to check them out. They have a lot of resources and help for you. Okay, and that is the end of my presentation. Does anyone, do we have any additional questions? We may need to ask anyone online, please raise their hand since yeah. the chat isn't um, quite cooperating with us yes. today. But so, yeah, raise your hand and we should be able, Aaron should be able to unmute you. Um, and also of course the evaluations coming up that Aaron's gonna mention and you can put questions there. Yep. Oh, Sherry. Okay. Hey, go ahead, Sherry, you should be able to unmute. And I apologize, they are, I apologize if you guys are getting the noise, they are apparently testing the alarm here. My apologies. <laughs> um, is the DBE only for services, not supplies? You're on mute. Yep, sorry. I if, if I am remembering correctly, I believe it can, I believe for the most part it services, but I believe it can also qualify if you are providing materials for construction. Okay. But I will double check on that and I will get back to you, Sherry. And um, I did have another question. Okay, shoot. The, the small diverse business program and the small disadvantaged business, can you be certified in both of those? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And your PBE certification, that PAUCP certification that you have, it as, as long as you are eligible under the requirements for both programs, you can be certified for both. Your DBE um, certification, through the PAUCP will actually work for certifying as a small diverse business. Now, the only thing is, of course, their pro the um, requirements don't aren't a one-to-one -one overlap. So if you are 
um, a member of the LGBT community or a service disabled veteran, um, those you aren't you aren't considered socially disadvantaged for the purposes of the DBE program. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, um, at the end of this webinar, is there you're going to send all of the slides um, to people who want them or? So how that, yep, yeah, uh, you're actually getting a little bit ahead of me, Sherry, but I will say that now. Yes, so when you leave this webinar, when you exit, there should be a survey that pops up. Um, if you could fill out that survey, including, it's just five quick questions. Um, the third one, I believe it's the third one, is you just putting your contact information in there. And if you give us your contact information, then yes, we will send you out these slides. Okay, that's all. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Sherry. Does anyone else have any questions? You just go ahead and raise your hand if you do. Okay, I am not seeing anyone. So, okay, so I guess we will wrap this up then. Again, I want to thank all of our um, co-sponsors, the North Central PTAC, the Northwest IRC, and the Penn West Clarion SBDC. Um, so, but thank you guys so very much for helping with this. Um, all of their contact, their websites are listed here. And of course they gave their contact information prior. So if you're interested, by all means, reach out to them. Um, and again, just please complete our evaluation survey. We'll get the slides to you. And if you have any other questions, uh, let us know and we will get them answered for you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again for so much for joining us. I apologize for any little technical hiccups here and then, but I hope you guys have enjoyed. I hope this has been informative to you and I will hope to see you all soon. Thanks, Aaron, for an informative um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Barb, I appreciate it. Thanks, Aaron, good job. Thank you. Good job.